Brian, thanks for being here with us. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So, so are you familiar with the hypothesis of what we're, we're trying to attempt here for the next hour or so? You know, at a certain level, but I'd, I'd love to hear you explain it. Yeah. Detail. Well, so, so the idea was, is what we wanted to do is we wanted to go deeper into the backgrounds of some of like the executives on our team, some of our like really senior consultants and things like that, and start a conversation because, you know, I've been out in the market for a long time talking about things like the four quadrants and the three things and the 10 circles and, and such, right? All the stuff that's up on the website that I, that I talk about all the time. So what I thought would be kind of cool is to get some of you guys and to go like really deep into what it is that we're actually doing on client sites and talk a little bit around it. Super casual, super informal, and uh, just a conversation. We'll just kind of kind of see where it goes. Sounds good. So what's cool about having you be my first guest is that you and I have a lot of history together. <laughs> we do. So, so you want to tell, tell our listeners a little bit about like how we met? Sure. Sure. I'm leaving, I'm giving you a really open uh, palette yeah, here, so be careful. You know, please. it was such a, it was such a fascinating time. Um, what's that? Probably 2000 four or five or something in that kind I'm of range, like I 13, think. 13, 14 years ago. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And uh, so uh, you and I were both in, at Check Free in those days, and I was... Uh, You're a director of development. I was a director of development. I was running a team uh, in the in the e-bill space. And I was a project manager. And and you were a project manager in a yeah. different part of the organization. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was building a new team because we were... Um, we were setting up a new organization. We were actually, um, we were we were moving um, a team from from out of the country down in, into Norcross, and had to build up a whole new team from scratch. Was that the first thing that I did with you? Was the Waterloo? Yeah, yeah, the I think so. I think so. That's what I remember, anyways. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know what I think? Actually, like the first first thing was is we were working on the Evil Five project together, but I didn't work for you at the time. Your team was involved in that. I remember. So let me, let me see if I can, if this rings a bell, right? So I had never, I'd like heard of Agile, but like I had no experience with Agile. And so we were doing RUP and like the traditional Pembox stuff and all that kind of a thing. And I sent you an email and I said, okay, so you guys are doing Agile. Tell me what Agile is about. And I think you sent me some Mary Poppendick stuff or you sent me the Agile Manifesto or something like that. What I, what I sent you, I remember, and I probably still have this someplace, um, it was the world of agile according to Brian. That was it. Yeah, that was absolutely the title. And it, it was a. Uh, it but was, I think uh, you totally ripped it off from Pop and Dick. Well, what I what I what I did was sure. Um, <laughs> Pop and Dick was a was a was an influence for me, no, yeah. no doubt, and and several others, you know, um, in in those days. And I had I had consumed everything um, from those that I looked up to and yeah. built my view of like what was what was the right way to develop product um, over some number of years and had assembled that into, into my message. And that's, that's what I gave you, but yeah. sure it was heavily influenced yeah. by Mary Poppin Dick. I, I think those two things happened in the opposite order, but, but, it, but they might not have, okay, cool. um, might not have. Um, the, the thing that I, that I took away from that experience in those days was, you know, you and I had gotten to know each other a little bit, um, just, just casually at that mm -hmm. point. And, um, I kind of knew what I wanted to be able to achieve um, I knew something about how you looked at the world and knew it was completely compatible with um, with the the principles that I held to to be true. And so I knew when we were building out this this team, and it can be either one of those programs, yeah, um, sure. building out that team, um, assembling the talent that was going to be necessary to go and and achieve you know a really big objective in a really short period of time that was one of those, that most people would look at and say, it just, it just can't happen or it's going to run into trouble. Um, but we knew it had to happen then. And I had the latitude to assemble the team that could mm -hmm. make it happen. Um, I remember thinking, okay, I've got to go get, get Mike and, Very cool. and, uh, and have him share the pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pain. Consider the pain <laughs> shared at this point. Yeah. So, so what I thought was <clears throat> really, really interesting about that time is that we were like, like really, if you think about it, Agile at scale hadn't been invented. Like Leffingwell hadn't done his initial work on scaled Agile. The uh, Larman and Vode stuff hadn't been released. 
um, nothing about scaled agile, but we were doing agile at scale from like the very, very early days. That's right. Right. From yeah. the very beginning. I mean, I don't remember the size of that team exactly. It, it, it eventually became probably, you know, 200 people or 300 people, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and in those, in those days, so if this was 2004, 2005, something in that kind of range in those days, then, you know, for the most part, agile was still, you know, maybe one team of, of six or eight or 10, yeah. maybe two teams of six or yeah. eight or 10. That was the level of kind of coordination and, and orchestration that was required. And we were setting out to do, you know, several hundred people on, mm -hmm. you know, an enterprise scale initiative that, uh, that needed to, needed to go fast, needed to go right, needed to move into this financial services space where there's not much tolerance for, for mistake. You know, you're going to move people's money around. Yeah. You got to move it right. Can't be off by a penny. Right? Can't be off by a penny. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we were we were definitely in a position where we were having to put together constructs that allowed us to connect, legitimately connect from here's here's this strategic imperative to here's the hundreds of people that are going to be involved. How do we marry those up? How do we yeah. make it happen? Yeah. What I thought was really interesting about that time is that we had <clears throat> mainframe teams that were doing pretty hardcore waterfall with like biannual releases and things like that, all the way to some of your teams that were doing like straight technical XP That's kinds right, of yeah. practices and trying to figure out how to marry all that stuff together. It was fascinating. It, it was, you yeah. know, um, in that same period of time, not on, not on that same program, but in that same period of time, we also had teams um, interfacing directly with uh, really large banks. Yeah. Like the, you know, largest banks in the country, Yeah, which were also, you know, to your, to your point about our mainframe teams being, you know, kind of traditional, waterfall driven teams well the the banks as oh, yeah. as an entity that's the only thing they understood and and um looked at anything contrary to that to be um you know to just be an inappropriate way to build software but we had, we worked out in those days um really clear ways to interface between you know these kind of kind of high speed um adaptive teams that were constantly sort of seeking learning responding and these giant banks that were were not that we worked out pretty simple ways to create yeah. interfaces between them so that both could move in their lanes and in the way that they needed to and in, in keeping with their you know compliance and regulatory requirements and all that kind of thing but we could we can match them up uh, to deliver on big objectives yeah, i remember one time i think i drove up to charlotte to meet with some executives at mbna and to teach them about how we were managing software projects yeah that's right and i was supposed to have other people go with me and like all you guys like <clears throat> ditched me or something i'm sitting there like is this relatively young you know project manager, like teaching all these folks at the bank about agile, right. Yep. And risk management yep. and things. So what were some of the key takeaways <laughs> from that time? What, what helped us be successful? You know, one of the, one of the pictures that comes to my mind, you'll, you'll remember it well. Um, uh, it was, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to, to say this now, but it was the portfolio tree, right? Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. course, and we, so. you know, we came up with a way of decomposing. What are the, what are the critical uh, factors of of the portfolio. Yeah. How do each of those decompose and normalize into diff what what today we would call pro uh, programs, yeah. or maybe today we would call product teams. Yeah. How do they decompose into things that we're going to feed particular backlogs across the enterprise, which might be different people working in a little bit different ways. Um, and then how how did that cascade ultimately to teams that might be Scrum teams or might be XP teams, what what have you and be able to show to to ourselves, um, you know, driving these results, but importantly to you know senior executives that were completely unfamiliar with with all of this way of working, how it was under control, how yeah. we had a reliable plan, how we were demonstrating progress against so I, that plan. I think one of the interesting takeaways during that time is you, you'll again like I wish we almost had like a, a whiteboard and we could like we we drew like the what I'm going to use today's words that we weren't using those words um, 15 years ago. But we had the portfolio at the top, the program in the middle, we had the team level stuff. And the way we talked about it was that the portfolio established constraints for the program, the program established <clears throat> constraints for the teams. So the teams had autonomy to decide unless they violated the constraint, the level above the program had autonomy to decide unless they violated the portfolio stuff. And what we were trying to do at the time was there's a really heavy change management culture. And we were trying to figure out how to get the teams to be able to inspect and adapt in the small and really put some guidance around it. So like not every single thing that the teams were going to change 
had to go all the way up to the top as, as a change management initiative. Yeah, that, that's right. And what was, what was fascinating to me about, and, and really sort of um, formed, solidified some of, some of my way of thinking about these things. In some cases, those constraints, as we would identify them, they would be identified as, as explicit contracts mm-hmm. between systems. Yeah. So, so here's how, so it, it, you know, it, it took what we had understood about architecture and enterprise architecture and, and good design principles and applied it to good program management disciplines that, that folks like you also brought to the table. So we put these principles together and, and swirled them around and came up with, okay, well, wait a minute. If we're, if we're thinking about how to, how to orchestrate across these teams and set up those constraints, and we're thinking about good architecture and design principles and the, and the delegation of responsibility into these different teams that own these different components. How do we, how do we get explicit about what's the, what's the contract across which they're sharing? And then well, we could turn them loose to do what they well, needed so to do. So what was fascinating is, if you, again, this is so long ago to put yourself in this mindset, but it's like the, the prevailing wisdom at the time was that you would create a complete cross-functional team with all the skills necessary to be able to do everything. Right. Well, we were dealing with systems that had like front ends and dot net and Java middleware systems, reporting systems, uh, COBOL mainframe systems. And some of those systems were like like risk engines and things that required a tremendous amount of domain expertise. And you just weren't going to let anybody touch that stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Encapsulating that domain expertise. And yeah. then like just add one more one more layer. And I know I already said it, but maybe one of the providers within that that whole set of programs is one of the banks who's mm-hmm. contributing maybe UI components or maybe yeah. back-end components that all have to fit into this this set of capabilities that are going to add up to the whole. So yeah, yeah, bring in, all right, bank, hand over two of your people and and COBOL team up in Ohio, hand over two of your people and and reporting team and data analytics for what there was data analytics in those days, hand over two of your people and we're going to swizzle together this cross-functional team. That just, that just wasn't remotely practical at this kind of, of product to this, this kind of scale. Well, I think that, it remains to this yeah. day not practical. Yeah. That's where we've kind of landed in today's language is organized around business <clears throat> capabilities, encapsulate teams and services and things like that. But just that we just didn't have the languages crisp at the time. Right. One of the things that you had, um, uh, I think it was an example you used back in the day that really helped under- crystallize it for me is that we would make um, service calls out to, I think it was Equifax at the time to do like credit authorization. So if you're going to start up a bank account, you had to get a credit authorization. And so they were putting capabilities into their product at their own pace. And we were putting capabilities into our product at a pace. But there was a point in time where what we were developing, what they're developing had to come together. We didn't have control over their people. They didn't have control over our people. And that was like one of the first examples where I went, okay, if we were going to have two totally autonomous teams um, um, creating services that were interdependent with each other, how would you orchestrate and make sure that those two things came together at the same time. And, and what it was, it was like, whenever it was within a company, you could always make the case, well, why don't we just share people? Why don't we do this? But when it was two different companies that had to come together to provide a common service, that was a, that was an interesting use case. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. we, we applied that, that you know, design principle, system design and program design principle, which was aligned one-to-one mm-hmm. in those external interfaces. But as you'll remember, we, we did apply that to our internal interfaces as well. Yeah. You know, the, it comes to mind, I think even in those days, we yeah, were, you were we just were, ahead of me at that time. You we understood were, it better than I did. The, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe for a week. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, in those, in those days, you know, we, we would think about the, you know, principles like Conway's law and, and the importance of um, respecting the communication boundaries in in an enterprise. In case somebody's not familiar, Conway's law. Give us a brief recap of it. Yeah. So, so in a in a nutshell, I probably won't use exactly the right language, but mm-hmm. in a nutshell, then the the way that components of a system interface with one another will naturally follow the way that teams are organized and interface with one another within the organization. So um, while the while the prevailing wisdom was, you know, let's put together all of the cross-functional people and build these feature teams that work across all of the layers, in a lot of cases, I'm, I'm certainly not saying in every case, but in mm-hmm. a lot of cases, especially in these big systems at scale, 
you're 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 working opposite to this this principle that you that you want to respect in the design of the system and and convoluting the communication patterns between those people are going to cause the architectural patterns to blend and you'll no longer have boundaries that are respected between components and and then those components won't be able to adapt on their own over time yeah. respecting their their own objectives they'll they'll experience chaos and entropy that leads to poor performance uh, much faster if those if those boundaries aren't respected so if you want the boundaries to be respected mm -hmm. then the organizational boundaries have to be respected as well yeah but the challenge with that is that is that when you have like cuz one of our classic problems this is a, a problem that we've been trying to solve conceptually forever and we we have solutions but it's a it's a non trivial problem we were building systems of systems right so you had um, i think back in the day we had the platform right and that was a set of services that were consumed by multiple other products and then you have those products that are coming along and injecting requirements down into the services right so what we would end up with is we'd end up with services that were effectively a constraint in the value stream you had multiple products that were trying to inject um features into those core services and they would become the bottleneck within the system that would prevent all of these different things from, and we'd like to avoid that. But as I, you remember that giant spreadsheet that like I, I pulled together yeah. that did like all the, yeah. the resource yeah, leveling yeah, across yeah, teams yeah. and stuff. I still wish I had, do you, you have a copy of that? I'd love to, to see a copy of that at some point. I doubt but it. I spent months like yeah. working on that clandestinely uh, while I was trying to do the rest of my job. Cause I was like, there's no way I was going to do resource leveling like some other way. But anyway, large story, like, long story short, what we were trying to do is trying to figure out which teams were the constraint in the system and then basically respect the capacity of the constraint and subordinate the rest of the system, the flow across the rest of the system to the constraint. And that's where a lot of organizations that we work with, I think really struggle is that they have a constrained team or a constrained capability within the system. And they just continue to build around it without ever actually elevating that constraint or investing more resources in the throughput of that constraint. Right. So the overall ability to serve the market is, uh, you know, experiences friction mm -hmm. um, because we, we don't elevate that constraint. We don't we don't resource that constraint in the appropriate way. We don't feed the the product teams at the rate that they need to be fed and new capabilities coming from that platform. Um, and and so one of the one of the things, of course, we learned to do in those days um, the the platform itself had to start understanding better what the market was going to need yeah. right it wasn't only fed linearly from product down because the the platform was itself going to serve multiple products so so it really you needed to look at it just like a single product serves multiple customers and if, yeah. in most cases, if you start getting in a position where you start thinking about your product in a in n equals one mode instead of an n equals many mode, then that that product starts to starts to suffer. It doesn't it doesn't move at the rate necessary to move the market in the way that you need to move the market to gain the market share in business. So, performance. so let me see if I can restate what you just said in a minute. So it's like it's like the platform service was like a product unto itself whose customers were not only the external market, but also the products that were going to consume it internally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so right. it had to it had to go out and to more, pro, rather than just being an order taker and saying, okay, I'll build whatever services you want whenever you want them. It had to go out and look at its customer base and prioritize its backlog to bring the highest value features to market. As yeah, that's right. Could, so we right? needed, and, and there, of course, this is, this is a balance. It's, yeah, not, it's sure. not an obvious black and white thing. But we needed for the product, I mean, the, the platform, excuse me, to start acting a bit more like a product, yeah. recognizing that it's serving many customers. Its customers were the products. Yeah. Platform was serving the products. The yeah. products were its customers. Yeah. It needed to act more like a product, get a little bit ahead of those customers, yeah. feed them what they were going to need to be able to solve the market problems that, that, that our ecosystem as a whole was was being asked to, to, to serve. But of course, that was... You know that was moving into some um, some weird multi-dimensional prioritization mm -hmm. of requirements across the it was enterprise. That right? yeah, yeah, it was complicated. Yeah, it was hard yeah. for people to get their head around. Well, but that's was, kind of why necessary. we ended up having to go with the kind of the portfolio layer because the portfolio had to be the arbiter of the business's priorities because all the programs were in effect competing with each other for yeah. resources. Yep. Yeah.
Fascinating. Okay, so one thing I want to just give a nod to, um, it's like um, somebody who's heavily influenced uh, our thinking on this was David Anderson's stuff around the, the pre-Kanban stuff, the agile yeah, management right. stuff, right? And so I, I like to throw that out because, um, you know, it's like we, we talk about the agile thinkers a lot. And, and I would consider David one of those guys, but it's like he was the guy that introduced me to theory of constraints, right? So then read all the Goldratt stuff and you know, that kind of a thing, but that was huge in really understanding how to run a portfolio. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. In fact, you know, I, I was, I was caught a little bit when you said, I know we were, this isn't exactly what you mm -hmm. said, but how it came in my head was we were heavily influenced by these agile guys, but then also people like David Anderson. Yeah. Um, and I guess like for me, it's all it's all in the same system, sure. right? Yeah. Um, I've I've just always imagined that as different pieces of science that are leading us to understand how to stitch together the the way of working from from the top strategy to the last line of code. How do we bring the right science into yeah. that system and, and design it? In the probably in the, the reason I made the slight distinction is because I don't think Mary's um, writing much anymore. I don't yeah. hear much from David. He might be out there. Um, I just I don't see as much of their work as I do like with the guys that are doing Scrum and less and you know safe and things yeah. like that. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. So Check Free gets acquired by Fiserv. I moved along. I went and go work for Version One for a couple years. Um, had a, had a time with pillar out of Columbus, um, started leading agile in 2010. So after I left, like, tell me a little bit about how your career took off. Um, so let's see, when did, when did you leave? You just I would say 2009 ish, early Nine, 2009, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was probably just right after Oh no, that. it was probably eight. It was probably eight. Cause I did almost two years at version one and then about 10 months at pillar. Okay. And then, so Leading Agile will have its 10-year anniversary, August 1st, 2020. Yeah. So 2007. Yeah. So I even. continued to, to Getting um, run development. We did a couple of more um, programs like the ones we were talking about a minute ago for another year or year and a half, and then um, moved over to a, a different part of the organization, uh, Global Payments, um, as, uh, as CTO. And... Uh, you know, immediately took the same. Did you skip over vice president? You just went from director to CTO or yeah. did you actually get like an intermediate promotion <laughs> no, there was, at some point yeah. in time? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I remember um, during that time I wanted you, I had always planned to try to chase, chase you down and get you to come work with us. And uh, like, we couldn't keep up with you. It's like, you kept getting promoted and your salary kept getting bigger and all this stuff. And so, yeah. So you were yeah. like on rails at that point. Yeah, yeah. no, it was, it was great time. And, and, and honest to goodness, um, it was taking the things that we that we built together over those years, you know, figuring out how to solve these big complex problems across big complex organizations and and beyond the boundaries of those big complex organizations into our corporate partners, like you mentioned Equifax and we talked earlier about Bank of America and others. Um, taking those those ways of working and and going into a new organization, um, you know, inside Fiserv and, and implementing that system, realigning the organization, getting it built around, you know, what are its, its primary capabilities and products, standing up this, this flow of, of decision-making that connects all the dots from strategy to execution and, and taking the organization from um, struggling to move quickly enough or impactfully enough to serve the markets that it was serving um, into, uh, you know, really high performing teams that were innovating and creating new products. Well, so you had two classes of challenges. So as you were advancing in your career, you were basically taking what you had learned, um, in your business unit and you were trying to apply those lessons learned into a much like broader corporate ecosystem. Talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges with that. So it, it, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is sort of similar challenges in that, um, we're a company that has, uh, you know, been in business at this point, 26 years or something, um, have done really good work in, in the market, you know, created whole new markets out of, out of nothing, um, you know, the company had. And so, of course, it had, um, it had ways of working that produced meaningful business results that led, led to significant growth. People knew how to work within that way of working. So it was, it was deeply rooted, right? There was a DNA in, mm -hmm. the, in the company that informed how people thought about doing their jobs. 
And so now we're coming along and applying, you know, these lean agile ways of working, lean agile ways of designing the organization, lean agile ways of connecting flow from strategy through execution. And it looks very different. So the, the challenges really start from there. It's like the, the hard wiring of the people and their understanding of what it's going to take to be successful is, is going this direction. And we're coming along and saying, well, we need to go in, in this direction. And, uh, you know, what we, what we, what we did over those years was help figure out what stood in the way between the people doing the work and, and the customers or stakeholders who needed the results of that work. In, in just about every case, the things that had started to amass in the organization that were interfering with delivering at the rate that, that the company wanted to deliver or interfering with delivering the impact that the company wanted to create were that the people doing the work had been moved back, you know, one step at a time until they were, you know, four or five or 10 layers away from who's actually going to benefit from this value that we're going to produce. And so we started recognizing a pattern of, of needing to restructure the organization in some way to take these people that are going to be the producers of value and move them much closer to the people that were going to be the consumers of that value and, and cut out the middlemen. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we still need to have good architecture. We still need to have good business analysis and understand what's really important to the market still needed um, and um, more and more needed super effective product management. So all of that was, was part of the process but basically remove all of the all of the walls in between the producers and the consumers so that they were talking to one another, could share perspective, share understanding, um, communicate clearly about goals and the best opportunities for achieving those goals and 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 move much more quickly. So, so let's it, pause there for a second. So like on a re-anchor on where we are, right? So your career's taken off, your CTO, CIO, you have business partners that um, you know, you're you're in effect running a business within kind of the Fiserv ecosystem. And so you come in as the technology leader within that organization, recognize that people are too far away from the customers, that the not connected sufficiently to value. How do you as a leader begin to start moving the organization in that way, given given how culturally entrenched it was and the way it had been working? I think it starts with being a little bit bullheaded. <laughs> yeah. A little stubborn. <laughs> a little stubborn. Yeah. Um a little determined. Mm-hmm. Um, fearless, a little fearless. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, but also, um, you know, an, an absolute critical part of it, um, especially in those first steps was, um, you know, just happened to, to marry up really good with, um, with the business unit president mm-hmm. who, um, had a clear understanding of what needed to happen mm-hmm. and was willing and interested and motivated to sit with me and talk through what we needed to do to make that happen. Yeah. And then, you know, gave me the room to, to make the changes. Um, Yeah. You know, run, run the experiments, prove the results, build on those results. So we talk a lot about the importance of engaging the business, the whole business agility movement. It's what we're doing with Elevate Agile, right? In a lot of ways, but this isn't like just get the product owner to show up and write requirements for you. (laughs) This is like, this is like legitimately getting somebody who is running hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue to take this risk, right? So what did you do to, to build that kind of trust with your business partner? You know, it, it started with, I, I think a lot about this because so many of the clients we're working with today are suffering yeah. from exactly this yeah. thing. And it really started with, um, I, I understood or quickly understood what was important to, to Pat. And I was obsessed with what was important to, to that business unit president. What, you know, what his few hundred million dollars of revenue was became, you know, my goal. Mm -hmm. And, and as, you know, as quick as we could make it so then, then he would understand that I was going to do absolutely everything possible. And then a little bit more to achieve that goal. Like that, that was the goal. Whereas the conversation that he's used to having was something about some, you know, technology problems or some risks or, you know, some, some reason why, you know, we've got to spend this much money on this technology because it's going to make a neat product versus, 
you know, here's, here's our revenue objective. Here's our expense objective. Here's the organization that we have to align with that. Here's where we're going to pull the levers to drive that revenue. Here's how we're going to align the organization then exactly at that target. And so we flip the conversation to those business outcomes from, from, you know, just about day one. And then just partnered together on what are we going to do to, it, to make it's a fascinating observation. Real. Cause one of the questions I get asked, like when I do live talks or if I'm talking to a user group or something is like, how do you get your executives, um, you know, bought in, right? Cause a lot of people want to do agile at this point and they're even funding it, but it's like, just, they just don't feel as committed. And that's the first piece of advice I give them is you got to care about what they care about. That's right. You know? Care about what they care about. And, 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 you know, I think for me, it just, it just happened to be, um, that I'm so wired to care about that. Like those right. business outcomes, there's a lot of stuff that's important in business. You know, most businesses, they care about their employees. They care about their customers. They care about their community. They care about the markets they're serving. They care about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. But but no matter what, when you, when you break it down and get <clears> down to it at the end of the day, what they have to care about the most, people will argue with me about this, but what they yeah. have to care about the most is... Am I positioning my business to be successful? Am I generating yeah. the revenue? Am I generating the profit that I need to be successful? Because if I'm not doing that, all these other things that I care about, I'm not going to produce them. So I've got a funny aside for you. A couple of years ago, I had somebody work with me on the leadership team. And I guess I was being a particular jerk that week or something. I was being pretty, pretty rough. And she goes, she goes, if you keep acting this way, you're going to kill our culture. And I'm like, well, if you guys can't figure out how to fix this stuff, we're not going to have a, we're going to have, to have a culture <laughs> can, to kill, right? Yeah. Culture to kill. yeah. And yeah. so there is, it's a funny chicken and the egg because it's like all those things around employee satisfaction and work environment and empowerment and autonomy and, you know, all that stuff is, is critically important. But if it's not delivered within the context of a, an economically viable company, it, that you don't get to answer that the second part of that question. Yeah, that's right. You know? yeah, yeah, you don't get to answer it. So it started started there. Yeah. Um, I think right right behind that, um, I had I had watched so many times in my career, um, teams or even you know organizations and departments, um, sort of flirt with something that needed to happen, but never really go make it happen. Yeah. They would, they would just sort of buy time and write it out and accept the constraints and mm-hmm. stay in their box. And inevitably, because they the thing that they wanted to change was likely stuff that needed to change. Yeah. Inevitably, the the time would run out and somebody else would change it. Yeah. Right? Eventually something would become a big enough problem to leadership in the company that they'd just come along with a really you know, really, the really big hammer mm-hmm. and knock stuff over and move walls around, yeah. you know, do, do major renovation. Um, my wife and I have done a lot of renovation over the last 10 years. Like, and, and when we think about renovation, it's not, I'm going to, I'm going to put a new coat of paint on the wall. Yeah. You and, like break things down and, and, like I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going like to put, yeah. uh, you know, some, yeah. some new trim up, Yeah, you know, yeah, when when we think renovation, it's like, well, I know the builder put this wall here, but that wall is interfering with what I want to do with my dining table that'll seat twenty people. Yeah, and so it's it's in the way of me achieving my objectives. I'm gonna I'm gonna move the wall. So eventually, somebody would come along with you know with the gumption to move the walls. Figuratively why do, why speaking, why do you think we're so inclined yeah. as employees within companies to just to see the walls as immovable? Cause I think that's the biggest thing. It's like people can't see past the constraints to a better way yeah, of doing things. Right. I think, I think you're right. Um, why are, why are we that inclined? Um, I, isn't it mostly human nature? I think, I think, so. I think it's largely human nature. People, um, willing to, or more comfortable seeing their sphere of control than their sphere of influence. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not feeling emboldened to go out and add to the sphere of influence to create the opportunity to say, yeah, that wall is in the way of us achieving our objectives. Let's let's do real renovation here. Um, so I think that was the that was the second thing for me. So you know, start with what was important to him. Second was, um, folks are going to come move the walls. Mm-hmm. I'd rather be the one that's moving the walls yeah. than waiting for somebody else to to move them. 
Well, so, so let's pivot a little bit. So we talked about the fact that I used to work for you back in the day. And then like at some point in time, I guess, like I said, 2010 ish, um, started leading agile pretty soon after you hired us and we came in and did some, some work for you guys within, within Viserv. So talk to me a little bit about what is it like to lead transformation work from the inside? Like what kind of leader do you feel like you needed to be? to not only orchestrate us, orchestrate your teams, to make the kinds of changes that, that you needed to make. So basically this is your opportunity to give advice to other leaders that might be out there listening to this or watching this. Um, what, do they, what do they need to do? Yeah. Who do they need to be maybe is the question I really wanna ask. Confident in, in your vision of what it is you want to happen and why and how you're gonna be able to demonstrate that, um, that progress. You know the place where my mind went first in this conversation was give the business unit president what, what he needs. Well, now lead and agile is coming in, you know, behind me and they're, and they're helping me to make that real. Mm -hmm. And so I'd created the, the space for it to happen, but, but now that's only the start where we have to go from there is constant feeding, you know, up, up to that senior leadership team what we agreed to go do, it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Here's the results that we that we promised. Here's how you can measure in in reliable and objective ways that what's important to you is becoming more real in this organization. So direct, you know, traceability from the results of our transformation to the to the business re results that were um, that were important to that person. So th to me, that's where it starts. So being confident in that vision, being able to 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 demonstrate clear results demonstrable measurable results but then being absolutely hands-on so you understand the reality of what's happening across the organization i think that so you don't get to just like hire a bunch of consultants yeah. and name a director of transformation and let it go yeah it um i haven't seen that work too i haven't good. seen it work yeah yet. okay yeah you know what here's the here's this is this is almost too tactical um but i think it's important like I would, I would inevitably wind up sitting around a, a boardroom table and fielding some questions from, you know, a senior executive team about, you know, this aspect of the transformation or most likely the question started with this, this consideration related to their business results. And if I couldn't connect the dots 10 layers deep into what we're doing and why it's going to add up to what's important to them, then then I'm certain I wouldn't maintain the credibility necessary to continue making the changes that uh, that I wanted to make and that I knew needed to to happen. In the so the so the analogy I use a lot is I'm I'm kind of an aspiring pool player, pretty lousy pool player, but aspiring pool player. I talk about the idea of calling your shots. You know, the ability to say this is what we're going to get to do. We did it. And it doesn't count unless like you were able to say that you could do it before you did it. Yeah. Kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and so is there some way to build on that analogy to say it's, it's call the shot, but also the next three that are going to happen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and be yeah, able the good to say, players can actually like, you know, right. the table that way. Yeah. yeah so sure. I think, yeah. I feel like that's, that was, um, I think that was, was really important to be able to, to call the shots and demonstrate control, but it's, it's calling shots like, three or four, you know, shots out in front. I'm going to do this because that's going to lead to this. That's going to lead to that. And that's going to lead to that. And then being able to, when something comes up, when some challenge comes up, which might be a legitimate challenge, something's not going right, or it might be. And I, and I think sitting here today, I feel like it was more often mm -hmm. um, some misunderstanding that somebody had somewhere. So being able to participate in a conversation to be in the place and participate in the conversation when that problem came up, whether it was a real problem or just a misunderstanding or miscommunication and be able to understand for real what's going on and to be able to diagnose that and connect multiple dots across different parts of the organization to, to say, no, here's what's really happening. Here's, here's what we need to do to all understand it better. Or here's what we need to do to adjust it so that it heads on the course that we need to do. Being able to, to, to really, um, you know, roll up the sleeves and, and get into the weeds when it's necessary, I think is, is super important to sustain and change. You want, you want to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole with me? 
Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> he looks skeptical. So, so kind of a selfish question. So we did this Elevate Agile conference a couple of weeks ago. And the, the one thing that we're trying to do as part of that conversation is, as the name implies, elevate the conversation, right? So we're not incessantly talking about team level practices or safe or process. And cause like what I was seeing is cause is, is the, the CEO of leading agile, like I, I get out and like, I kind of sell, right. I tell our story a lot. And what I was finding is that when I would start to tell the story, when I would mention agile or, or even safe or, or something, people are like, Oh yeah, that's what the teams do. Right. We need to have a conversation about what, what, what are we doing from a business perspective? Right. And so that was like the backdrop for that conference. And so we tried to orchestrate the content and get everybody, but it's so difficult to talk about even agile at scale or business agility, it's difficult to elevate the conversation around agile because it's like it because it's like you because you need to connect what's happening on the ground to the business results. It's like you have to have a conversation across the entire stack. So you start to talk down here and you lose the executives. And if you start to talk up here, you're not connecting enough dots into the how. So like, I'm finding that very personally challenging from a messaging perspective. It's like almost like how to like, navigate the different layers of abstraction in the conversation and make sure that people are anchored at, in the conversation where you want them to be. So I imagine you dealt with that a lot, right? You're dealing with a division president, but yet there's a tension and almost like a pull to want to talk about like what this team's doing over here. Or if you're talking about this team, like how does that translate into like the business objectives? I know I'm like, that's, I probably put you on the spot here, but like, talk to me a little bit about the tension between having that conversation at different levels as an executive in a company. Any thoughts? Well, okay. So where, where my head first goes is, is sort of the, the same place where we were, was being tuned in enough. So as the executive. As the, as okay, the executive. Sure. Being tuned in enough so that, you know, at, at nine o'clock in the morning, you're, you're sitting at the at the C table and having a conversation with the president and the COO and the CFO. And we're talking about the performance of the business and our, you know, fourth quarter revenue and, and where we're at being able to walk from, from that nine o'clock conversation to a 10 o'clock conversation with a couple of the teams related to how, you know, their current release is performing and how they're, how they're expecting to to deliver against expectations or not helping them to understand why it's important and how the result of their release is going to connect to these business outcomes that, that were just discussed in the prior, in the prior hour, being able to go from there and, and have conversations with the, you know, maybe the chief product officer or something like this about how we're thinking about the, the next series of product releases across all of these products and how we can look at, at cross-cutting or synergistic opportunities that feed demand into the organization that allow us to accelerate. So being able to, to walk hour by hour into those different contexts and have sufficient situational awareness to understand what we're really trying to do and why it matters and help the people that you're talking to, to reconnect with why, I think is a super important, super important part of it. It's almost like the line of demarcation is almost like at the business architecture level, because it's like at the business capabilities, business architecture, everything below that is teams and execution and performance characteristics and how you're managing it. And then from the business architecture up, it's more like aligned to strategy. Is that, you think that's a, a decent way of thinking about it? I, I think it is a decent way to think about it. I think there, there might be a couple of dimensions in play at the same time. Okay. Um, you might have, you might have. Um, business architecture and its current alignment uh, to strategy, um, how, how that set of, of business capabilities or products or value streams is, is assembled to support execution against your, your current strategic imperatives. Um, maybe simultaneously, though, you have analysis going on um, in what's important in the market and how likely over the next 18 months, over the next 36 months, you're going to need to, to make, make big pivots in the market and mm -hmm. strategically head in a different direction and be able to understand how that comes down through that business architecture and, and, and puts pressure on it to pivot in ways that it's not currently designed to be able to pivot. Um, and then maybe, maybe coming up from the other direction, um, you know, the, the raw te technical architecture 
that's supporting that business architecture and being able to think about those cross cuts and understand how those are put together and how they might need to change. So as you, I just, I'm trying yeah. to think of, there's about, yeah. about three or four different dimensions yeah. that you probably have to be able to think through and, and synthesize yeah. to, to, to make the even, best decisions. Even when we interview direction. senior consultants, right? So like a lot of times I'm trying to get a handle on how they think about business architecture and team formation strategies and things like that. And then like everybody thinks I'm talking about team level agile or talking about scrum or something like that, because it's like, I see the stack in its full dimensionality and like getting people to anchor on like where you're at in that conversation, I think is really, really difficult. Yeah. Right. Where, where in that, where in that conversation are you going to anchor? What frame of reference are you going to look at it through and, and who are you going to participate in the conversation with when looking at it through that frame of reference. Yeah. So I have an interesting pivot for you now. So, so as an executive, um, one of the things that was really awesome about working with you is that you just deeply understood this stuff, right? So you come from a architecture background, right? So you think in terms of services and business capabilities and things like that. And so is, as you and Dennis were working together and as you and I would have conversations, this language was very native to you, right? You, you deeply understood it. So now you're on the other side. Right. So now you're going in and you're talking to executives about um, that maybe are not, I don't want to say astute, right? Because they, they're, they're super, you know, obviously super smart and have, have uh, successfully led their companies, but they might not come from the same background that you do. Right. How have you navigated that transition? Yeah. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, you're hitting on, on one angle, which is, you know, sort of the language and the, and the depth of understanding. And sort of needing to pull the story up yeah. to meet an individual where they are. Now, that kind of meet them where they are has always been part of the process. I mean, we've kind of talked about that in yeah. a few different ways now. So it's always been a motivation. But sometimes where our clients are is a very different place than you know what, what I've had direct experience with. And so trying to get inside their head and quickly understand how they're seeing the world. Well, it's a fascinating challenge, right? And so, so for anybody who's um, followed anything that I've done for a long time, you know, really going from project manager, agile coach, agile consultant, you know, starting a company, you know, growing our company up to 120 people or what have you. Um, there's a lot of marketing, right? There's a lot of storytelling that goes into it. And, and if you, if you bring the story too high, it just looks like everybody else, right? There's no differentiation. Right. Oh yeah. You solve business problems. You align, you do this, right? So like the, the secret sauce is and somehow like there's an operational model underneath it, right? There's a change management. There's a, there's a way of thinking about business architectures, a way of thinking about teams and governance and alignment and tying execution to strategy. But then at the end of the day, it is about strategy articulation, right? It's about business value. So there's a funny little dance that we're trying to figure out how to do. It's like, you have to tie to those things that everybody else is talking about, but the, how you get there, um, is, is fairly unique. I think yeah, how we're thinking about it a little bit. No, I, I think so. It's, yeah. it's unique and it's, um, I mean, obviously I, I can't speak to this without some bias, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but I think exceptionally comprehensive. I mean, one of the one of the things I think everybody listening knows what we do for a living. So it's, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> one, so. one of, well, yeah, I just, I'm yeah. sure, I mean, of course I think it's yeah. exceptionally comprehensive. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but it, it is, I, I believe there's, there's so much, um, it's so thorough. Our mm -hmm. way of thinking about what makes organizations high performing and what has to get built, what has to get nurtured to make them high performing We've we've talked a couple of different we've we've made a couple of different paths now at this multi-dimensional frame of reference. I need to I need to assemble the parts thing, including the conversation, like to your to your very last point, the conversation with this executive who you're trying to help understand what it's gonna take to to erect the kind of organization that they're that they're gonna they're gonna want. And there's there's 10 different dimensions. And, and 30 layers of depth in each one of those dimensions, all of which can be part of the conversation at any one point, but choosing just the right thread through yeah. all of that for this one need 
Um, it's it's tricky, and I won't say I've got that all all figured out. That's certainly yeah. I don't think any of us have it totally uh, figured out. Continuing to grow in for sure. Well, so so maybe like final thing, and this is like this is total totally orthogonal to everything we've talked about so far, but kind of related to this last point. So I started writing. I don't know if it's going to be an article or a blog post, or just maybe it's just a collection of thoughts. But like when you start to think about all the personality profiling stuff that we do, like to to hire or help our our clients build teams or whatever. I mean, we use emotional intelligence, intellectual intelligence, behavioral profiles, um, you know, are you logical or um, emotional controlling, non-controlling kinds of things. Um, The latest thing that I've been thinking a lot about is growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Um, I'm actually starting to like wonder how any human beings ever share ideas or talk to each other at all. Like, I mean, the amount of insight that you almost have to have about another human being sitting across from you is it's mind numbing. Yeah. I don't know. So now that you're kind of on this side, like, like what's been your observations around that? Like knowing how people tick is a, when, as you get in and start talking with them a little bit. It, uh, it's, uh, it's obviously critically important, but it's, but it's hard. Um, but you made me think, you know, Mike, as you went through those, you know, emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence and all these different systems thinking, non-systems thinking as one of them. Um, yeah. You know, that there's that, uh, there's that quote, some, something like, um, all models are wrong. Yeah. Some models are useful. Yeah. Right. Um, so I try to keep that in, in, in mind, even, even with the, the background that I have, or maybe because of the background that I have in, in architecture, um, in architecture, then boundaries are, are really clear, right? It's, Mm -hmm. you know, you're a producer or you're a consumer, you're sending this message or getting this response. I mean, the boundaries responsibilities are, are really clear. Um, nonetheless, when you start backing up and looking at the enterprise, you're contemplating all of those boundaries in some sort of, of abstraction, hopefully an abstraction that is still adding meaningful value to the conversations that you're trying to have, right? Cause you don't, you didn't carry all of the detail into that conversation. You're using some abstraction, you're mm-hmm. using some model. And, and in that model, hopefully we've pulled up the right considerations that are most important and most impactful to what we're trying to decide in that, in that particular exchange. Right? So when I think about all of those different tools that we use, um, I, I think about all of them as part of a, a comprehensive model that is absolutely valuable and it's absolutely right, but it's not a hundred percent right. Sure. Right. Yeah. There's, well, I was thinking, I was thinking about it, right? So it's just totally reference. This is totally self-interested kind of just, you know, just an exploration. Cause it's something I think about all the time. It, it's, it's almost a little bit like it comes down to like the, what we call our influence trust loop, right? Where it's like, you have to have empathy. You have to have a point of view. You have to create safety, you know? So like, if you're just, a, if you're aware enough of those kinds of things, you can get kind of close and build an influence relationship right. and then do what you say you're going to do. You, that, that's probably a lot of it. Cause at some point, I think it gets back to what you're talking about with your, your division president at some point in time, at some point you earned enough trust with them to be able to say where he said, okay, I trust that you have my best interests at heart. You've influenced me. You've demonstrated that you can call your shots and we're going to let you, let you do it. But I think at some point you have to bust through that abstraction and just earn somebody's trust and let them yeah, and have them let you go do something. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And what we, what we see so often when we're starting with, with new clients is the, the conversation is I, I need that boss to do X, Y, Z differently. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're approaching the organization wrong. They're asking for the wrong things. They're using the wrong measures. They need mm-hmm. to change that. Mm-hmm. Like, but we're not yeah. at any place yet to ask them to change anything. Yeah. We've, we've got to meet them where they are right yeah. now. Understand what's important to them. Yeah. Understand how to start creating trust with them because we're, we're calling our shots and demonstrating control and in that giving them what what they needed and as they get more of of what they need and as they see that we're going to do everything possible to 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 provide uh, for their interests then they'll start to then they'll start to trust more 
And in that trust, they will give us more influence. They, yeah. they will give us more Im- ability to influence um, how they're going to approach things. And, and that's when we can start really accelerating change. But we can't start with, uh, you need to change. We have to start with, what are we going to do to change for them? Very cool. Well, thank you for being here. It was awesome. I really appreciate you spending time with me. Yeah, I enjoyed it, Mike. Yeah, very cool. Good to see you.